What is good, everybody? Juliana Page here, and I wanted to share a message. I was led to share, rather, a message that I think will resonate with many. And so I'm just going to get out of the way and share here. And I'm going to share particularly on three different things. But I wanted to start by saying one of the things that I absolutely love is drawing out or complimenting or calling forth the gold in other people. And let me clarify that. So what I mean is it is really easy, really easy to find the dirt, right? To find the things that we don't like, to find the things that make us uncomfortable, to find the things that really are sort of unaccepted or unhealed pieces of our shadow self, not necessarily our light self. In other people, it's really easy to find that stuff. However, what's not as easy and what takes practice and what is so powerful is when you can call forth the golden people, the greatness in people, the glory of God in people, the potential of people, and you can call that forth, right? And it's really biblical to call those things that are not as though they are. So if somebody is not showing up in the way maybe that you would hope or expect that they would show up, when you start speaking to them and how you see them and how God sees them, something shifts in them, right? Because they start to accept the invitation. So for example, if we know there's dirt in our lives, if we know that there's weakness, if we know that there's things that are not going the way we'd like them to go, we know that. And so when we're reminded of that by other people, it doesn't bless us. It doesn't help us. It actually brings up some sort of resentment or wanting to put somebody at a distance. But when somebody is calling forth your gold, it is so powerful what can happen when you do that. And so that is something that I believe in. It's actually one of the reasons, too, why I love prophetic ministry so much, because it's all about hearing what God has to say, to encourage, to build up, to really comfort a, another person and to really love them and to speak life over them and allow them to be uplifted. And we all could use that, right? So training in that is so, so powerful. And you really do that kind of training by practicing with yourself, right? You wouldn't say to somebody else what you wouldn't say to yourself, right? So it's a beautiful practice to really, to really do and try on. And I want to share that because calling out the gold is a mission. It's a ministry. It's leadership, really, simply. But how did I get there? So I want to kind of share some insight. So I was listening to, it might have been, I don't know if it was a talk or what it was, but I was listening to something and a woman had been asked what her greatest fear was. And she had shared that her greatest fear was that people are not inherently good. Um, that was number one. And number two was that she's not value and her, her place or her position in the world is not meaningful. It's not making a difference. Those were her two greatest fears. Interesting thing is this woman is She's a psychologist. She she puts a ton of value and beautiful teaching into the world. And she embodies love, right? But these are her greatest fears. And so in a lot of ways, they've driven her to highlight the good or to teach people simple practices to draw forth this gold, so to speak, like I'm highlighting, and to also build resistance against that fear of not being worthy and not being valuable by being of service and by embracing teaching and, and serving, right? And that actively every day has built resistance against that fear because ultimately she could believe that. She could believe that people are not inherently good and she's got facts to prove it, <laughs> right? Um, and she could also believe that she's not worthy and valuable and go into depression and cycles of just really unhealthy patterns and really deciding, for example, whether or not at an extreme, whether or not she even wants to be in the world. Right. So I thought that was interesting. It really made me reflect on my own life. Right. When you hear somebody else get asked that question, I invite you to ask yourself the question too. So in this case, I'm asking myself, well, that's interesting. What is my greatest fear? 
And I had the opportunity to share that maybe even a week ago on a uh, big brainstorm call and which will tell you how much healing can do, right? Because I was not a share at one point in my life. Um, but I remember sharing that my greatest fear, and I've articulated this differently over the years, but it really gets back to the same thing. My greatest fear is that I would leave the world untapped, right? Like that I'm not tapped out, that I, that I didn't work out of me everything that God put on the inside of me to get out while I was here. Like that would be my greatest fear that I get to that day and there was still so much more that I was here to do and I didn't even get busy about doing it. Right. And I did what I thought was valuable or I limited myself or I let other people distract me or get me off the path, whatever it might be. But I somehow never got busy about what I was here to do. So I've always articulated that as my greatest fear. But when that woman spoke too, it also highlighted how at a very young age, I too had believed something similar. So I had found out that I was adopted in a very traumatic way. And I've endured many traumas over my life story. And I think all of those made me believe two things. One, I fear that that life is unsafe, right? Because these things just keep happening that are not good and they're out of my control. Like it's not safe to be here, right? It's unstable. And so that keeps you in this constant state of anxiety. So that was one. Number two is that I'm not worthy because I was kind of passed off, abandoned, betrayed, forgotten about, you know, you know, the feeling of out of sight, out of mind. And if that becomes your reality, that's a really heavy feeling to deal with when you don't have a sense of home or people that care about you. And when you don't know what you're here for, or really even who you are <laughs> or where you come from, right? Like those are heavy and those are really deep. And so I, I experienced for, quite a long time without being able to articulate it that I didn't feel worthy and I didn't feel valuable. And we live in a world that if you don't know who you are and the value that you carry, you will be eaten alive in a sense. Like people will take advantage of you. People will dishonor you. People will not, people will misuse you. So what I would, another way to say that is there's a way that you are designed, that you are formed, that you are shaped, that you are anointed, that you are meant to be operating in the world. But there's a way as well that you're designed to be honored and treasured, right? And if you don't realize that, you will allow, tolerate, enable, attract far less. And I have found in my own work that a lot of times it's it's those that have really your hearts or, or hearts that have this tendency, like I'm mentioning here, to highlight the good in other people that have a tendency also to overlook the bad and to not adequately discern somebody's intention or their heart, which can be a not so good experience. <laughs> so why do I highlight this? I highlight this because I'm inviting you on today, number one, to take a look at what you call forth in other people. That's number one. What do you call forth in other people? Are you, even if you don't speak it, are you constantly thinking about in your mind about the dirt? Are you talking about the dirt behind their back? When you speak with them, what are you acknowledging? What are you giving life to? What are you giving energy to? What are you focusing on? So that's number one. What are you calling forth, particularly in relationship and connection to other people? What is your, your influence or your impact on them, right? So then next would be, what are your greatest fears? Or what is your greatest fear? If you only identify one, what are they? You know, I'm mentioning that it would be that I didn't get busy about what I'm here to do. And also that I didn't matter, right? Or that it wasn't valuable what I invested in or my impact was not even an impact. Do you, do you see what I'm saying? Like my, what I thought was an impact really didn't have impact. Do you see what I'm saying? Like it wasn't significant. So insignificance would be another way to simplify that. Okay. So from that, okay, because usually when you have a fear 
or fears up, <laughs> fears the, right? You want to highlight the opposite because it's usually the opposites that's true. Honestly, I would go to what the word says. Does the word say that about you? Because if the word doesn't say that about you, then it's a lie. And often we've been trained to just accept and believe lies. We really have. So there's got to be a practice of cultivating truth in your life and also declaring truth over your life and partnering with truth over your life or just telling yourself the truth every day so that you can rightly discern what is true from what's untrue. And there are some truths that are heavier truths. I don't know if you've experienced that, but I know that to be true. Okay. So given what your fear is, what is the opposite? So in my case, right, that you barely even, let me see how I can say this. So the fear of you're insignificant, it's really that you are more powerful than measure and your impact exceeded your wildest expectation. Okay. So you're like, wow, like my work is highly valued and widely received and treasured. Do you see what I'm saying? So that is, that is the shift because just like you can believe a lie, you can believe the truth, right? And it radically changed your experience in the world. So then the other one would be that I juiced out of myself <laughs> um, more than I even realized was put in there. So that not only did I leave the world tapped out, but there was no juice left, right? <laughs> like I got every last drop. So you can flip it and just pay attention to what that does in your body. Literally, like what does that do when you believe that instead, when you start meditating on the thought or when you start using your imagination to think on what does that look like or what does that feel like or what, what happens in your heart, right? Like, is there excitement? Are you inspired when you hear that? What happens for you? And so what this process does is it also opens up a practice that you can do all the time. So I believe in guided meditations. I mean, I am somebody that can sit in stillness, but sometimes I need a little guidance <laughs> to get myself going down a path of inviting myself to think about that. And so where I can really train myself to guide myself into these experiences of what I do want to visualize and what I do want to experience and how I do want to feel. Because a lot of times we don't know that because we don't practice it. We're so clear on what we don't like and what we don't think is good and how we don't want to feel and what we don't want to experience. We don't like and how other people are showing up, but we don't often practice what it is that we do like and what we do want to see and how we do want to feel and what we do uh, want to practice that, that because we're focusing on everything that we don't want, we don't get to live in what we do because we give all of this so much energy. And I read, even in my practice today, I read about in Isaiah, how we are called to forget the former things. Like that is one of the surest and quickest, or I believe acceleration happens when you decide to partner with this truth. Like I am going to forget the former things. I'm going to forget that that is my experience because God is the God of the new thing. God is doing a new thing. Will I not perceive it? Well, I'm not going to perceive it if I'm caught up in all of the former things or, and I'm not going to perceive it if I'm committed to believing lies or I'm not going to receive it if I don't receive this truth down into my heart. And if I don't let it take root and actually believe it and step out into a new thing, start telling myself a new thing, start prophesying new things, start feeling the way that I desire to feel, start trusting in God and that he's leading me to a good place and he longs to lavish his goodness on me. Totally different life experiences, but that is a choice. Okay. So this opens a process of guided meditations. Okay. So I am inviting you to try on this practice every day identifying the fear, identifying the discomfort, identifying the trigger, identifying the pattern, whatever it is, don't just ignore it. Don't feel bad that you have it and that it's coming up. Acknowledge, like don't lie to yourself basically, because you'll make that a habit and a practice. And then you'll just feel 
inauthentic and it'll be harder for you to be real and true. And the purpose, the person that you need to be real and true to first is yourself. So start doing that. <laughs> and if you want a different experience, if you want to step into knowing your worth so that that's not just a cute hashtag, you actually know your worth and you live your worth. <laughs> This comes from this internal work. So you've got to start telling yourself the truth and you've got to identify and really acknowledge, ooh, that's not true and shine light on it. Shine light on it. So anytime something uncomfortable comes up, let's say that you feel invalidated at work somehow. Is it true? Were you really being invalidated? What is it that made you feel that way? And how is it that you want to feel? And then as you start imagining this, and this doesn't have to take long, but as you start doing this, maybe take five to 10 minutes to do a guided meditation. Give yourself a prompt from that experience. What is the, how can I validate myself right now? What is the state that allows me to operate at my best in this atmosphere? What is the outcome that I desire. Okay. And just sit with that and let yourself go through a, a meditation, answer that prompt visually. Okay. So visualize the experience and how could that have gone differently? And then how can you show up differently in that environment? Visualize that. And you'll start the more clear you get, right? The more you can show up and start addressing those things. Okay. So those were two things I wanted to share so far. Lastly is this is big. So when you experience a lot of negative experiences, it could be trauma as well. But when you are, are trained to anticipate things not going well, <laughs> like you're, you're almost waiting for that other shoe to drop, that is no way to live. And you don't get to manifesting your desires from constantly living in that state of negative expectation or fear or anxiety. Okay. And the word tells us to delight ourselves in the Lord. The word tells us to really strengthen ourselves, right? We do that with joy. The joy of the Lord is your strength. So I need to take joy. Joy is medicine. So I literally need to take my joy every day and I need to choose it. So I need to identify that I can choose stress. That's actually a choice. I can choose to experience this in a stressful way, or I can choose the joyful way. And if I choose joy, I'm going to be strengthened and go through this and come out stronger. But if I choose stress, I'm basically giving my power to the situation to run me and have its way with me. Okay. And that often is the difference between people that are resilient and people that are not people that choose addictive habits and behaviors to cope and people that create really other healthy, high functioning habits that are good for their mind are good for their hormones are releasing toxins, right? Very, very different life experiences. But what I want to highlight is it starts with a choice. And so I have found that applying God's word to my life and choosing that, even if I don't feel like it, has been incredibly rewarding. So I'm going to give you a couple of things to make a difference <laughs> that can make a difference in times of opportunity, um, challenge, struggle, trouble, whatever you want to call it. But trying times, you can try on something different, okay? So... I'm going to give you four things that you can do if you've noticed that there's these patterns and that you continue to be reacting in the same kind of way. All right. So number one is exercise. And I know that for some, this might seem like a no brainer. And for others, it could seem like, are you serious? Like the last thing I want to do is move my body when I'm feeling depressed or discouraged. But even when you don't feel like it, the very act of training yourself to show up and to apply discipline and self-control and work through that stubborn energy, that process that you experience when you exercise is actually training your mind 
it's changing your, your body chemistry, right? It's releasing toxins and unhealthy stress repercussions and consequences from your body. And it is strengthening you and it is energizing you and it's doing so much more than you can think, but you've got to choose to move your body. So even when you don't feel like it, even when everything is telling you just to sit on the couch, if you just get up and if you move your body, it will work wonders on you and you will feel so different. Maybe not in the first five minutes, but definitely by the time you're finished working out. Great example. I often do this to kind of switch gears my day even, but even yesterday. So I was working probably up until I want to say six. And at that moment, I was feeling sort of like a wave of tired or just not feeling as present as I normally do. I didn't have that creative flow happening. I'm like, hmm, do you know what I mean? Everything in me is like, oh, just take a nap. Oh, just sit on the couch. Oh, just like don't do anything. And I had some things that I had set on the calendar to do. And when you work for yourself, you've got a choice to do it or not do it. Who's going to call you out? Right? But I don't like that. Because integrity is a big deal to me. And if I write it down, it's going to happen. So (laughs) I'm like, okay, what do I need to feel better right now? And what I needed to feel better was I needed fresh air on my face. I needed beautiful scenery. I needed to breathe. I needed to move my body. I needed to switch gears. And I needed to listen to encouraging words to feed my spirit. Okay? So I drove to this beautiful lake that we have in Texas. It doesn't even look like Texas. I don't even know how this lake got here. (laughs) Um, But it was beautiful. The way the sky was too, it just, I don't know. There's sometimes you just feel like God is winking at you. Um, And it was just beautiful. It was exactly what I needed. And I felt so refreshed and I was able to come back home from that experience and knock out those things that I had intended to do with so much more focus and intention and presence that I don't believe would have happened had I just chose to sit and stay and just ignore it or make an excuse or an allowance for myself to feel bad. That's not what I wanted to reinforce. So a lot of times having a standard, I'm going to call it a standard, having a standard that exercise is non-negotiable, that moving my body in some kind of way every day is non-negotiable, particularly if you are in a time in the season where you're sitting more, you've got to make that happen. Okay. It will shift you literally. So number one is exercise. Number two is service. A lot of times, particularly if you're feeling down, defeated, depressed, like you don't matter, like you're not worthy, like you're missing meaning and connection and just nobody cares about you, the best thing that you can do to to break that or contradict that lie instantly is to get out and serve people. Truly, that's the best thing that you can do. You start to realize so quickly how untrue that thought was and how, how you can choose to be of service or not. And you're never gonna know your impact unless you're busy about giving what you already have in some kind of way. You, One of the quickest ways to keep receiving is just to get busy about giving. It really is. And that will shift you immediately. So that's number two. Number three is meditation. And I want to highlight the difference because I've experienced the difference. So meditation, some people feel good about it. Some people feel awkward about it. Some people don't know how to feel about it. (laughs) And I believe that a lot of people can't come to it until they are in a place where they're desiring the benefits that meditation can bring so much so that they're willing to experience it. So here's some of the difference. Typically, we hear that meditation is just observing your thoughts, releasing your thoughts, letting things go. Um, I get that. But for example, that allows me just to, to get present. But I feel like what's been more powerful is to me, biblical meditation. So getting a promise, getting a truth, even doing a guided meditation around truth that 
allows me to be mindful. Like I'm putting something in my mind and I'm meditating on it, meaning I'm mulling it over in my heart. I'm imagining that truth operating in my life. And that is way more powerful because what happens is, is it starts to activate faith. It starts to give me a vision of how that's personal for me. It's not just something in a text that was like back in the day. And it becomes something that I, I, I become stronger and stronger at believing. I become more convicted about like to the point where I know it. Right. And I expect it. And that's what I need. I don't want to just leave a meditation and feel like that was good, but then just jump right back into busy. Like I want to leave changed for real, for real. <laughs> and in a completely different state and expecting something different, right. To be, to be, activated into something different. So meditation is meditating on a promise, on a word of God, on a truth, on a desire of your heart and visualizing it as if it is so, um, as if it is manifested, right? So really getting in the intention of being it before you do it. A lot of times we talk about doing, doing, doing all the time. And so the best work is when we're still, strangely enough. And I like to equate that sort of as like a bow and arrow. Like we have this fear that if we pull back, if we separate ourselves, if we isolate ourselves, the word would say, if we consecrate ourselves, then we're missing out. We've got this FOMO fear of missing out. Right. But the greatest things happen in your inner life. So the more you pull back, the more you're going to launch forward, but you've got to embrace the pulling back and you've got to cultivate that practice. So meditation is so, so good. I find that doing it first thing in the morning and like telling my mind where we're going today, super important. Having a break in the middle of the day to reconnect to that truth. And then even a gratitude practice at night where I'm sort of cleaning the slate or clearing all that so I can sleep soundly. Sleep is really important to me. So (laughs) having those windows, even if it's 10 minutes, 10 minutes, 10 minutes, at least you've given yourself 30 minutes a day where you're meditating. You're actually reflecting on what you're thinking about. It's a big deal, right? Like imagine how much more impactful, right? Your influence would be if you actually think about how it's going and how you're showing up. So powerful. So that's number three. And then number four, I would say is gratitude. Now, We hear this all the time, but why I'm highlighting gratitude is again, you get what you think about, what you focus on grows more in your life. And if you have a really, I'm going to call it a bad habit. If you have a really bad habit of focusing on everything that's wrong and things that haven't happened yet and everything that you're not happy with and all the ways that God hasn't shown up yet, you're constantly going to be unhappy and unfulfilled, but If you have a way of like breaking that pattern and shifting that and being grateful, you're going to find more and more things to be grateful for every day. And you're going to start reinforcing the rhythm, the state that is acceptable to you, right? Like you're literally rewiring your inner life. So when you're grateful, you have a tendency to look through those lenses every day. Okay. But if you're not, you, you often are careless with your thoughts, with your feelings, with your words, right? So the more you can be intentional about what is really worth your energy and you actually pull back and you start intentionally showing up and directing it, very different life experience. So gratitude is so, so important and it helps you expand your capacity to receive more. It doesn't sound like it, but it does. So for example, if you are not grateful for all these things in your life, you just see them as more work, more responsibility, more, right? good luck being open and available for more things coming into your life. But if you're grateful and if you're a good steward over all the things that are given to you, you make yourself a magnet for more. You just do. So those would be four practices that can really make a difference in times and seasons where you're noticing a pattern of withdrawing, isolating, being depressed, being discouraged. Just life is getting to you. And you've got to have a way to fight back, so to speak, but not in the way that you would think or imagine. So you don't need to give more energy outward. You actually need to put it inward. Okay. So a a great example of this. So people who are, let's say, single and they want to manifest their, their life partner, right? What I would say to that, rather than looking for this person and pursuing them and searching that for them and all this stuff, right? 
write down the qualities of what you desire in this person, not like a crazy list of all the things that they have to have, but what you actually desire in this person. How is their heart? How is their mind? How is their character? <laughs> what are they about? Right? Write all of that down. And then you yourself get busy about being that person. That's what I would say. Like if you, cause it is not fair to expect all of this. If you're not even worth, if you're not even bringing that to the table, so to speak. Right? So if your heart is a hot mess, you can't expect somebody with a healed heart to come to you. If your mind is all over the place, you can't expect somebody with a really great, beautiful mindset to come and be a magnet for you. Right? Like you get what you are. So get busy about doing your work and intentionally being that person in the world so that you can attract what it is that you desire. Okay. So what I would invite you to think about today, I hope that you're seeing how I've sort of woven this together here, but calling out gold is intentional. That is not something that is happenstance. That is not something that you just are naturally good at. That is something that you intentionally decide to do. And it is really easy to do the opposite. It is really easy to call forth dirt and to highlight dirt in people. That's a hater. And that becomes a bully when it's not controlled. And that is not what the world needs, right? So whenever those thoughts, I really don't like those questions. Like, why won't somebody do something about it? Start being the person that does something about it, starting with yourself, right? So start calling forth the gold in you. Start being your best ally. Start telling yourself the truth. Start partnering with yourself to do good, right? Call forth the gold in you, make that a practice, and you'll see how, how strong you get at being able to do that with other people as well. So that would be an invitation. Secondly, it's what do you fear, right? And then how can you get busy about the opposite? So you have this practice of guiding yourself into the truth, okay, every day. Because we are all going to face discomforts of some kind, but how you face a thing really determines your experience of it, okay? And that, that is something that you can really be intentional about. And then lastly, how you show up and manage opportunities, right, is something that you really practice so that in the opportunities where you need it the most, you can call forth those practices. So our practices are what keep us strong, healthy, in a good state a majority of the time so that when we're really challenged, right, by something, we can call forth what we've been practicing. Super powerful. So I hope this message has been informative, that it's been really helpful for you. If you would love some guidance on how to really align and live a spirit-led life, there are a ton of really great coaching packages over on julianapage.com. I also have a self-mastery course that has a lot of great homework assignments to do. I know I'm somebody that's practical that needs to write things down and I need question prompts and things too to literally do the inner work. And I'm also somebody that works well with time frames. So it's actually a six week course so that it's manageable if you're, you know, you've just got life things happening. That self mastery course is really good. There's also a devotional over there and a couple of books under the main heading God's Vibes Matter because they totally do. So if you feel like you could develop your relationship with God to really help you start calling forth the gold in yourself to start believing right. You can find all of that over on julianapage.com. If you would like some spirit filled real talk in your life, you can listen and subscribe to the Juliana page podcast, which is called spirit filled real talk with Juliana. You can find it on Spotify, the Apple podcast app, I believe on Amazon also. And then if you just want to follow daily and just connect with me, you can connect with me probably the best chance is over on Instagram at Miss Juliana Page. And if you haven't yet, make sure you subscribe to this. And if you know somebody who would be blessed by this message or who might need to hear this on today, make sure you copy the link and share it with a friend. All right, guys, until next time.